Hello and welcome to today's episode of Socially Distant Discover Nature. Now the topic today is bumblebee identification. We've got a lot to cover so I'm going to dive straight in. We'll start off with a catch up and I'll tell you what I've been doing. I have been planting many plants during my shifts at Brunswick and continuing to befriend or at least be in close proximity to blackbirds. So here's a little video clip of Beakerton of Bishop Thorpe. And this is Blackbird looking after his little chick near a compost heap. And it turns out there was a second chick and they're absolutely adorable. I love them all. Oh. Ooh, there's two. Two baby blackbirds. In the latest news about Beaky, the blackbird in my garden, I'm continuing to gain far more satisfaction from seeing him than is probably healthy or human, but I won't worry about that. And I think, well, I've definitely seen Miss Beaky, and I think I may have seen a Beaky Junior, a baby Beaky on the fence. But I will attempt to get some form of photographic or video evidence to prove that but it's exciting. Moving on to what you all have seen this week, we've got Emma from York who sent a video of a blue butterfly. Blue butterflies, I have often had trouble spotting them, let alone filming them, so it's very good we've got some footage. And I am under the impression it is a holly blue butterfly. These are one of the more easier blue butterfly species to distinguish because when they close their wings shut they have a very light pastel blue colour as opposed to a lot of the other blue butterflies that have a kind of oh, mosaic or pattern of browns and oranges and all sorts of stuff but if you see in a blue butterfly wings closed kind of pastel light blue it's gonna be a holly blue Sean has sent us in some photographs of various creatures that are often, I think, underappreciated. So first off we've got some flies. If you remember from a previous episode, flies think eyes. Flies have got big, kind of buggy compound eyes, taking up most of the head. And here we've got a St. Mark's fly, which can often uh, be on the wing in huge quantities. Uh, I'm not going to say swarms, but they can get everywhere at this time of year. I've also got this rather impressive looking dagger fly. Again, incredible, incredible details on these photos. And finally on this apple, I think it's an apple, is a calcid wasp. So a form of parasitic wasp. Full disclosure, I had never heard of this until Sean sent me the photo. But if you notice the huge spiky thing coming out of the abdomen, it's not a sting, it's an ovipositor, so it's an egg-laying tube. And no doubt it is going to probe the surface of the apple and then try to kind of dig down and then find some other grubs of different species, lay its egg in there, like the kind of uh, alien from the film Aliens. See, uh, science fiction is actually real, in fact not fiction. And yeah, very, very interesting behaviour. I'd also like to thank Catherine from York who spotted this butterfly. Very impressive specimen. This is a peacock butterfly. Now, it's quite recognisable, but if you're new to butterfly identification, it's one of our bigger ones. So you, you'll see this thing coming from quite a way off. And it's got its wings open, it's sort of a rich, dark, reddish colour, but it's the eye spots that give it away. Huge eye spots, named after the peacock, you know, the peacock feathers with the eye spots. Peacock butterfly has these big circles. A couple of theories about the eye spots. One is that if a bird is going after a creature, often it will peck the eyes to disable it. So if a bird is going after this butterfly, pecking out its eyes, it's actually just ripping off the corner of the wing. And the butterfly will still be able to fly away to safety. Another school of thought is the eyes are there to function like actual eyes to make the butterfly appear bigger, fiercer, or at least shock a creature that's going after it. 
I have first hand experience of this working when I volunteered up in Scotland on RSPB Vane Farm, kind of running down a hill, and then suddenly there had been a peacock butterfly on the ground and woof! Wings opened up, sudden flash of colour, scared the life out of me, nearly kind of fell down the path and twisted my ankle. So yeah. Fortunately, I didn't become the first person in the UK to be killed by a butterfly, but you know, it's not a bad epitaph. Now to finish off our catch up, we are going to go live to our roving wildlife reporter, Genghis Marazapan. This is an appointment that I definitely do not regret, one iota. So, Genghis, over to you. Yes, hello Phil, here we are again. Um... Genghis Marazapan, the uh, roving wildlife reporter, I've discovered this rather interesting pile of sticks. And you can absolutely guarantee that if you move a pile of sticks, you're going to be presented with a whole array of creepy craw... Oh. Not so good. To be honest, that's a bit of a disappointment. So back to you in the studio. Well, I don't regret it one iota, but certainly I'm starting to regret it two iotas. Verging on three. Now it's time to tackle the actual topic of the episode, which is bumblebee identification. Now, I should probably give a, uh, a recap of what we've learned in a previous episode about bee identification. So, if I have time, I will edit together a recap. But if not, then I suggest you go back and watch episode 5, B Identification, and then come back here and we'll carry on with Bumblebees. Good. In your mind, you will have an idea of what a bee looks like, and possibly it is something a bit like this. So as I said earlier, we've got over 270 species of bee in the United Kingdom, and of those, around about 35 are social bees. So these include the classic honeybee, and also your bumblebees, but there's a few others, and these are the ones that will live in colonies. There's also over 170 species of solitary bee. So these are ones that don't have any of that sociality. I'm not sure if that's a word. Finally, we've got around 75 species of cuckoo bee. Now these are a strange bunch and they make up most of the exceptions that I mentioned earlier. Firstly, important question, what actually are bumblebees? How do we tell them apart from different types of bees? As we learned about in episode 5, bumblebees are social bees. <laughs> to be a social bee means that within each species you have three distinct types or castes. You've got the queen, who is the founder of the colony and is living all the egg laying. You've got the workers, who are all females or sisters, closely related to one another. And then you've got the males, or drones, they can be called. Think mainly in honeybees. Who knows? We'll call them males. Bumblebees are generally your classic bees of cartoon and popular culture. They are big, they are furry, they're loud, they make a sort of loud droning buzzing noise, and one of the books, here we are, Edwards and Jenna describes their flight as slow and ponderous. And I can say that is absolutely right until you get a camera out and try to film them, in which case their flight is warp speed. As I mentioned, there's the three castes. You've got the queens, the workers, and the males. Queens and the workers do most of the work, and they have a special feature which helps identify them. So on their hind leg, their rear leg, they have a particular section, which is called the tibia. It's kind of a, a triangular shape. In the queens and workers, it is shiny, but on the edges, there's loads of quite long bristles, hairs, called corbiculi, and these are the pollen baskets. So this is when the bees are collecting pollen, and they're packing it onto their hind legs, they're packing it onto these bristles. So the result of this is you'll be seeing a bee that's flying around with kind of massive blobs of coloured pollen on the back, 
And these blobs of coloured pollen are stuck to those corbiculae, to those pollen baskets. Males don't have them. We're not going to worry too much about males. As always, everything I'm saying is kind of a generalisation. And there are plenty of exceptions. We've got the males to the exceptions. But also, let me play the exception alarm. To mention cuckoo bumblebees, which are not social bumblebees. They don't have the same three casts. They don't have any workers at all. Cuckoo bumblebees just have females and males. And neither of those have pollen baskets on them. Let's proceed further into identifying different types of bumblebee. And as in episode 5, we're not going to get too hung up on identifying them to species level. We're just getting to know the different types and the different patterns. If you want to know about species level, you can submit them to various experts or recording schemes. EcoSapien has an entire video playlist about submitting biological records, so I'll pop a link to that in the description. But for us, we're taking it easy. We can divide bumblebees into three not-so-neat categories. And by we, I mean me. These three categories are not something that will appear in any guidebooks. They're nothing to do with taxonomy, relatedness, biology, blah blah blah. They're just something that I use to kind of wade through the morass of identification and teach people about bumblebees. It might not work for you, but it sort of works for me. So we're going to press ahead with this scheme. The three categories are number one, what I would call classic bees. So these are black bumblebees that have a coloured tail of some type, and they may or may not have stripes. At this point, I should note out that coloured tail, uh, they don't really have a tail like a cat or a dog. When I'm talking about tail, it's the rear furthest tip of the, the abdomen, the rear body segment on the bumblebee is often uh, coloured white, red, orangey, brown. So that's what we're talking about when we're talking about tail. It's not something that's waggable like a dog. Category number two contains brown bees, usually known as carder bees. They all have brown somewhere upon them, and we'll go into slightly more detail in a little bit, but that is category number two. Category number three is very specific. These are bees that have a brown thorax, they have a black abdomen and a white tail. So that's a white tip to the abdomen. Very specific. Category number three. And now, because my videos are nothing if not massively convoluted and scatterbrained, we're going to tackle category three first, because it's very specific and it contains just one species. Category three, if you see a bumblebee with a brown thorax, a black abdomen, and a white tail, there can only be one species. This is the tree bumblebee, Bombus hypnorum. It's a recent arrival to the UK. It was first recorded in 2001 down south, and it's spread, it's definitely up here in York now, and probably much further beyond. Investigations seem to think it's not having any negative effects on native bumblebees, so if that's true, that is very good. We've gained a, a new species, uh, free of charge and of uh, badness, which is always nice. As the name suggests, the tree bumblebee likes to nest in trees or high up above ground. It will nest in kind of rotting holes in trunks, but if there aren't any of those, a bird box will do quite nicely. And the chances are, if you have a bird box that is occupied by bumblebees, it's going to be a tree bumblebee. They will readily take to nest boxes. Many people can find this particularly scary because often there are a big kind of cloud of bees. I'm not going to use the term swarm, that makes them seem evil and dangerous. A big cloud of bees hanging outside the entrance to uh, the nest box, looking quite sinister and ooh, stingy. Absolutely nothing to worry about. These are in fact male bees, male bumblebees, and they're kind of waiting there for the new females to come out so they can get a chance to mate. Their male bees can't sting. 
It's only female bees that can sting, so there's absolutely nothing to worry about. It has been said that the, uh, the tree bumblebees are slightly more aggressive at defending their nest than other species. I, uh, I don't know if this is true or not. I'm, I'm willing to accept the experts. I've, I've never really encountered any other bee nest beyond the tree bumblebee. I did try to get ladders out and go up and stick my head close to it and try to film it. I didn't get stung, but I did get a lot of bees kind of pelting me in the face, like uh, ramming me. And that certainly encouraged me to back off, which I did. Your only real confusion species for a tree bumblebee, perhaps, is one of the, the brown carder bees. Sometimes if the tree bumblebees are old, they're faded, it can be hard to see that white tail, which might make you think it's a different species. But if you, you get enough, a good enough look, it should be there somewhere, or even just a kind of hint of it. So keep an eye out for that. And as always, if you're photographing bees to send to, to me, or well, to anyone for identification purposes, try get it from multiple angles and take lots of photos, because, well, certainly uh, focusing on a phone is is hard. So I got completely confused about the numbering, but I think that was category three, which is tree bumblebees. Now we're going to move on to category two, and it's sunglasses time, because as always, I will start to get fried and blinded by the conservatory around about this time in the morning. I should really get up earlier, but I didn't. <clears throat> category two is the brown bees that we talked about called the carder bees. Now, within this category, there are several species. The most common one is called, imaginatively, the common carder bee. So, common carder bumblebee. This is the one you're going to see the most often. It's quite variable. The really fresh, freshly emerged ones can be quite vibrant, orangey ginger, but as they get older, they will start to fade and almost go grey, so in a, an extent they're like human hair in that respect. They start off sort of vibrant, and then they all eventually fade away to kind of grey-beige colour. Sean's also sent in this video of a carder bumblebee, which I'm presuming is a common carder. And Simon from Kent sent in these photographs, again, of a carder bumblebee, which in the absence of, uh, of anything else, I'm presuming is a common carder. Sometimes you do get them looking like this with a, a darker abdomen and almost like a sort of gingery orange tail. Very, very good. Very vibrant. Absolutely love the colours. There are other rarer species than the common carder. There's the moss carder, the brown banded carder. I'm not going to talk much about these because I don't know anything about them. I've, I've never seen them as well, so that's drifting well out of, outside my area of expertise. All I know is that the, uh, if you're going to see a carder bumblebee, chances are it's a common carder, but it's worth photographing it, documenting it, so you can have a closer look. According to uh, our usual reference point, Stephen Fox, the carder bumblebee, sorry, the common carder, will have black hairs on the abdomen somewhere. Um, it's kind of a kind of a one for a photograph. Sometimes these species can't be differentiated unless you get them under a microscope, which usually means they have to be dead or dissect the genitals, which definitely means they have to be dead, none of which I am encouraging you to do, so we'll move swiftly on and just presume, uh, unless anyone says otherwise, if we've seen a brown bumblebee, it's a common carder. But if you have seen the other species of carder bumblebees, absolutely let me know, send in some pictures, love to see them. Category one, or possibly three, depending on my scatterbrain numbering, basically the other category, are the black bees with a coloured tail that may or may not have stripes. Yellow stripes. We'll start off with a fairly easy one, and this is a entirely black bee with a reddish-orange tail, and as usual, the imaginative naming people have called this the red-tailed bumblebee. So the queens and the workers look Identical in pattern and colour, although the queens are absolutely massive, and I think we've 
actually got one sent in by Jack from York in inside her house. She seems to have uh, got a queen bumblebee. Sorry, a queen red tail bumblebee. I would at this point also sound the exception alert alarm. And say beware of cuckoos because there is a, uh, a red tailed cuckoo bumblebee which can look very similar to a, a queen red tailed bumblebee. Ways to tell them apart cuckoo bees generally are less hairy, and you can see the, uh, the chitinous exoskeleton. I think it's called an intergument. You can see their hard plating shining through. The wings can be a sort of darker tint, almost described as, as smoky. And of course, if you do see that, that hind leg looking for that tibia, there won't be any pollen baskets. So they won't have a shiny tibia with giant bristles. It'll have a kind of non-shiny tibia with tiny little hairs all over it. So that's a good thing to look out for. The males of the red-tailed bumblebees look slightly different to the queens and the workers in that they have one yellow stripe or collar on the front of the thorax and also they have yellow hair on their head and this is a, another good identification feature if you're seeing a bumblebee that's got yellow hair on its head also known as a, a yellow moustache if we want to go for the sort of gender normative <coughs> handlebar moustache yellow hair on the head means usually it's a male bumblebee however not all male bumblebees have yellow hair on the head, so it's another one of those cases where if you spot a bumblebee, yellow hair on the head, almost definitely a male. No yellow hair on the head, you still can't be sure. So that's when you'll need to look for those things like the pollen baskets, the bristles, which is automatically screaming female, so worker or queen. Also in this category we have some uh, more black bees with yellow stripes and a kind of reddish orange tail. More orange in the case of the following examples. The first one we've got is the early bumblebee, Bombus pretorum. The queens have two yellow stripes but I don't have any photos or footage of queens so I'm going to ignore them for now. Chances are you will see the workers um, of these bumblebees, they're usually very small and the, the orangey tail is not that noticeable. Workers do have a, a yellow stripe or yellow collar on the front of the thorax. As far as I know they're called the early bumblebee because they're one of the more early ones to come out in the season, although these days they're usually pipped to the post, if that's even a real phrase. They're usually preceded by things like the uh, buff-tailed bumblebee, which we'll get onto in a moment. The final bee with a kind of orangey reddish tail and some yellow stripes on that I want to talk about is the bilberry or blaeberry bumblebee. I've mainly seen this in Scotland, but if you're on higher elevations and areas like that, you might find it. It's got an absolutely massive orange bum, a massive orange tail that extends quite far towards the front of the abdomen. Here's uh, one of my, my only pictures that I have of it and it's, it's pretty special. Um, I really love to see it again. Um, it's got uh, happy memories associated with it of frolicking on a Scottish hillside in the sunshine. So remember we're still within the category one of bumblebees. So these are bumblebees that are black with a coloured tail of some kind and they may or may not have stripes. Now we've arrived at what I would call the classic bumblebees. So these are black bumblebees with a white tail and at least two or more yellow stripes. This is where things start to get extra tricky and to a certain degree impossible. Some of the species that we'll talk about, they uh, cannot be distinguished without dissecting and that involves obviously killing, so things become uh, problematic, shall we say. So the first thing to do is to count the number of stripes. So we'll start off with black bees with two yellow stripes, and here I'm gonna yet again break my own rules to give you a picture of a bumblebee that does not have a white tail. 
This is a bumblebee that has two yellow stripes, is black, and has this uh, kind of buffy, browny, orange tail. And this is a buff-tailed bumblebee queen. This is a really good way, a really, one of my favourite species, is because you can tell apart the queens and the workers super easily. Because the queen buff-tailed bumblebees have this buffy tail, but the workers do not. They have a, a different coloured tail. Now here we've got a picture sent in by Catherine from York, who found this bumblebee buff-tailed queen on the floor, on the ground, possibly uh, basking to warm up, ready to fly away. This is a great example for showing how queen bumblebees can sometimes differ in colour patterns from the workers. So the workers of the buff-tailed bumblebee are black bees, two yellow stripes, and a kind of whitish, buffish tail. They can easily be confused with workers from the white-tailed bumblebee. Again, it's a black bee, two yellow stripes, whitish tail. Telling the workers of buff tail and white tailed bumblebees apart can be tricky. It has been said that the buff tailed workers have a darker yellow colour to their stripes and that they have a sort of buff fringe of hairs between the black on the abdomen and the white of the tail. I think I've seen the darker coloration of the stripes. I'm not convinced I've ever seen the buff fringe. Whereas the, uh, the white tailed bumblebee is supposed to have a more vibrant sometimes almost lemon yellow colour to the stripes and a very distinct bright white tail. Some surveys just lump the two species together as one category, so buff stroke white tail bumblebee. So we won't worry too much about teasing them apart now. I'm also definitely not going to mention the other two yellow striper dark bees with white tails that are extremely difficult to tell apart which are the northern white-tailed bumblebee and the cryptic bumblebee. Yeah, just forget you even heard them. They don't exist, as far as we're concerned. Nothing. Gone. Our final set of bumblebees within the category of black bees with coloured tails and a number of stripes, or none, are the bees, the black bees, that have three stripes and a white tail. Generally, if you're seeing a bumblebee that's got three yellow stripes and a white tail, and by three yellow stripes we're talking one on the front of the thorax, one on the back of the thorax, and one on the front of the abdomen. So the, uh, the thorax abdomen stripe structure almost looks like a belt, kind of a, a belt around the waist of yellow. But they are kind of three distinct stripes. And the most common of these bumblebees is the garden bumblebee, Bombus hotorum. Oh, I love saying that. Bombus hotorum. Bombus hotorum. Sorry, I don't think I've got enough sleep recently. The garden bumblebee has an extremely long tongue, very good at getting into flowers like foxgloves, comfrey, all that sort of stuff. And here's some footage and photographs, because uh, I seem to encounter it quite frequently. Certainly in my garden, um, it seems to be the most common. Or perhaps it's the slowest, and therefore easily photographed. Who knows? That's called sampling bias. Google it. I should point out there's another species of bumblebee with three yellow stripes and a white tail. The heath bumblebee, Bombus janellus. I'm not entirely sure if I've ever seen one, certainly don't have any photographs or footage of it, but it looks very similar to the garden bumblebee, but it has a, a rounder, shorter face and a much shorter tongue. So, heath bumblebee, round face, short tongue, garden bumblebee, long face, the horse of the bumblebee world, and a long tongue. I think we've covered it! Woohoo! This is just orange juice, pure orange juice and I defy you to prove otherwise. Ah, Oof. That was a lot of information. So let's have a short break and go live to our roving wildlife reporter, who I am 70% sure may or may not have found something this time. Go. Yes, uh, hello, Will. Uh, thank you for getting back to me. Uh, 
Genghis Marazapan, wildlife roving reporter here, out here in the field, as they say. And I'm, uh, I'm very lucky now. I have found some, some bark that's fallen off a tree. Now, you can absolutely guarantee that when you turn this bark over, you will find all sorts of creepy... Uh, OK, you're absolutely guaranteed to find the underside of fallen bark, uh, which is a little bit of a disappointment, but back to you in the studio, Will. It's Phil. Phil. Well, perhaps you can do better than our wildlife reporter Genghis and have seen stuff and photographed and documented or drawn it out on your travels and your uh, socially distant exercise events. Definitely send it to us. We'd love to hear from you. Usual channels for Discover Nature People and for everyone else, if you want to find us on Twitter or our ecosapien show at gmail.com. Little banner should be appearing right about now. You. And I'd like to finish with this contribution from Sean, who sent in his first sighting of a tansy beetle. First sighting of the year. Incredible looking metallic green insect. And I've decided based on this, that's what we're going to look at next week. Next week's episode is going to be about tansy beetles. If you don't know what tansy beetles are, oh, you will do by the end. Mark my words. Um, little request, if anyone's been to the tansy beetle mural in York and has a decent photograph of it, do send it in, because I have nothing, and it's a little bit outside of my uh, exercise perimeter area. So yeah, um, if you can help me out, much appreciated. Full credit will be given. Social credit, not credit as in any form of financial interactions of which you will have none with us. That concludes today's episode. As always, try to stay safe, stay sane, stay socially distant, and thank you very much for watching. Until next time, goodbye. Because I believe in second chances, third chances, fourth, five, six, six, I believe in chances, we're going to go now live to our roving wildlife reporter Genghis, who I'm assured has found something this time. Yes, uh, hello Gil, lovely to hear from you, this is very, very, very exciting, through this hedge we've just caught sight of a hare. So when we get to the field, that's what we should see. Now, of course, we're very lucky because they've got such small ears, they can't hear very well. And also, of course, they, as we all know, they're very slow creatures. So when we turn this corner, we should be met with a wonderful view of a hare. Oh, well, that's a bit of a disappointment. Back to you in the studio, Gil. It's Phil. It's always been Phil. <sighs> I'm beginning to suspect appointing him was a grave error.